Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, and uh, I'm delighted that there's such a big turnout. I want to thank Kula and Dean and Drew and Nancy and Catherine Ann Trotter for supporting this lecture series and making it possible. Governor Tucker and Betty, thank you for coming. I want to thank all the people at the library here who have worked hard and been looking forward to this day. You will hear an interesting story tonight. A lot of you know a lot about it. Uh, but I thought I would, by way of introduction, just tell you how I got into this. And it was interesting. When, when Laura Ling and Unley were, in effect, captured, making their way out of North Korea, as you'll see. Um, I was really interested in it for a number of reasons. First of all, when I just heard about it and before I knew who they were, I thought it was in interesting and ironic that North Korea had caused yet another incident involving two Americans who were of Asian descent themselves. Then I realized that they work for Al Gore's TV network. <laughs> then I realized one of them was a sister of a person I had become friends with since I left the White House. And so as the thing went on, I, I heard both from Lisa and from Al Gore, and they said, would you go to North Korea? Because they say they want you to come bring them home. And I said, look, this is a bigger than me now and above my pay grade. I can't go unless <laughs> not just my Secretary of State, but the President wants me to go. And I think I should give you some background about this. We have, as you know, for many years had an on-again, off-again, mostly off-again strained relationship with North Korea. The Korean War was ended with an armistice, but never a comprehensive peace agreement. In the years since, North Korea has periodically done things we found somewhere between crazy, repugnant, or silly. And I think there are a number of reasons for this. The first is that they're determined to maintain their separate identity and their monopoly on power. And they're only good at one thing. They're great at growing bombs and missiles, even though they can't bring a rice crop in very well. They don't have any private sector economy to speak of. And I'm sure in the question session, maybe you ought to talk about what they did see of Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, which is quite a beautiful but very Spartan city. It's not that the people have no ability. They, I drove through a rice field on the way from the airport that was very well maintained and quite fertile, but it's much more mountainous than South Korea, and there's a limit to the arable land, and they don't have the technological capacity to maximize the potential they do have. So often, the North Koreans depend upon the world community to help them avoid mass starvation. They're chronically undernourished, and they need help for power. When I became president, they were in the process of using a reactor allegedly to provide them a nuclear reactor, to electric power, but the spent fuel rods had enough fissile material which can be converted into bombs. And we had a very tense encounter with the current president, Kim Jong-il's father. 
I won't go through all the details, but some of you may remember that. I, we had a big standoff. Uh, uh, I approved President Carter going to North Korea to try to talk to Kim, jo uh, Kim Il-sung, who was the president then. The end of it was I made an agreement with them with the support of the Japanese and the Chinese and the Russians that we would provide them energy and food if they would cease their nuclear activities and open the country to inspections and let us segregate any nuclear materials that could be fissile so they couldn't be turned into bombs. And it worked quite well for a number of years. And then we had uh, another little flare up and we resolved that. And in 1998, I made an agreement with them to totally end their missile production program because they produced very good missiles and they were selling them to people we didn't want to have them. Near the end of my term, they basically sent me a message that they would end their entire uh, nuclear activities and resolve all the outstanding issues between us, but I would have to go to North Korea. Well, that's not something you can just do at the drop of a hat. You've got to know American president's been to North Korea since the end of the war. So you have to go to North Korea, then you have to go to South Korea. They're our allies. Because I had a deal with the South Koreans that the United States would have no bilateral relationships with North Korea except on the security issues. They wanted that. But in other words, I wouldn't make any deal for economic development or anything else. So we, we had this agreement, and I was willing to do it, but I had to go to South Korea, Russia, China, all the major players in this. The Chinese and the Americans are the joint guarantors of the armistice with South Korea and North Korea, but Russia also had had a big interest in it. We were six weeks from the end of my term, and Yasser Arafat told me that he was definitely going to make a peace in the Middle East, but it had to look like I was making him do it, and so I couldn't go away for 12 days. And I didn't go, and so we got a double loss. The president of South Korea at the time was a man named Kim Dae-jung, who just died at the age of 86, won the Nobel Prize, was a political prisoner in South Korea, and then became president. He was a magnificent man, and he established better relations with North Korea than they'd ever had before. They set up a joint industrial area. South Koreans were employing tens of thousands, like 20, 25,000 North Korean workers. They got the most best jobs they'd ever had. And for the first time since the end of the war, they were allowing visits of, of South Koreans to go to North Korea and family reunification visits. But long toward the end of my term, it came out that while we had succeeded and or after I left office in 2002, after it came out that after we had succeeded in getting them to stop their plutonium production, which you can use the waste from to make nuclear weapons, they had a much smaller, still secret laboratory effort to produce highly enriched uranium that had not come to much yet. And even if it did, given their capacity, could never give them the capacity to have more than uh, one or two bombs. We stopped them from creating dozens of bombs. But the Bush administration took the position they were going to shut everything down because this violated the spirit, if not the letter, of our agreement. So our relationships were frozen for a long time. Then they started these so-called six-party talks with all the people I just mentioned. And so when they tried to get the Obama administration to send a number of people, but in the end they kept up in the ante and finally they said they wouldn't let them go if, unless I showed up. It was against the background of our having invested a lot in these six-party talks and President Obama quite understandably wanting to honor that process, even though it has been set up under President Bush, we try to maintain some continuity in foreign policy and you don't want to have to start all over again with all the deals that have been made in the six-party talks. So that's why this presented a difficulty for the president and for the Secretary of State, does it look like you're rewarding inexcusable behavior 
or are you doing something that is just humanitarian, how to deal with it, how to navigate it? They'll explain all that from how it looked from their point of view. But I wanted you to understand the geopolitical circumstances of it. We're still basically where we always are with North Korea. I think they sunk that ship recently because the current president's in poor health. He wants to maintain the support of the military, and he thinks that by whipping up this fervor in a conflict, it increases the chances that his designated successor, his 27-year-old son, will be accepted. But it's a terrible thing to do. You had all these innocent South Korean naval personnel killed, and it creates all kinds of problems, but it's the kind of mistake people make when they isolate themselves from the rest of the world and have no sense of what the larger consequences of what they're doing are. So this wonderful woman and her partner, for the best of reasons, which you'll hear about, got caught up in this global drama, which had really nothing to do with them and what they did or didn't do. And in the end, what happened proved that North Korea sooner or later is going to have to make an accommodation with all the rest of us and try to run a country where their people are better off year in and year out. They're good people. They deserve the same chance as everybody else does. I'm honored that I could play a small role in it. Uh, and I had to be careful about how I played it, and I'm sure that they'll go into that. But I, I'd also like to say something else. It's uh, They were threatened with going to prison for years in a North Korean prison. It's very scary to be someplace that's totally closed and isolated, and you don't know if your government can get you out or if the price of getting you out will cause some other problem, which will even be terrible, no matter how nice it is for you. And in my opinion, Laura and Una Lee conducted themselves really well under unbelievable pressure. I was proud to be an American when I saw how they had conducted themselves. And the trip we had home was one of the happiest trips I've taken in a long, long time. So you'll hear about it. I also want to tell you that if you ever get in trouble, you want a sister or a brother like Lisa. <laughs> she was like a dog to the bone. <laughs> and I admire that. And uh, so I know after they speak, uh, Ann Jansen's going to come up and ask some questions and moderate a discussion, and I thank her for that. But um, this is a good story with a happy ending, and it is instructive about where we ought to go, in my opinion, if we can, with North Korea and how we ought to conduct our business in the world. So let's give them a hand and let them get started. President Clinton, we, we are so deeply honored, so deeply honored to be here at, at this beautiful, beautiful library of yours. And thank you to the Comparis family. You know, I have to say, oh, wait, give it another ten. Can you? Ten, okay? nine, eight, seven. I have to say, it's a little bit odd to be known as one of the women that President Clinton rescued from North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the North Korean girl, as I'm sometimes referred to as. But if what happened finally allows me to tell the story that we set out to tell, I will gladly wear those designations. Um, last year, last March of 2009, I was on assignment for Current TV, and for those of you who don't know, Current is Current is a cable channel that was founded by former Vice President Gore um, to to really cover international issues, give give people a greater say in what's happening in the media. 
And at a time when the news networks were closing down bureaus and, and scaling back on their international coverage, Current was really pushing the envelope and sending a team of reporters around the world. We are having an audio snafu. Okay. I think mine. Thank you. Check, check. Hello? Hello? Is that okay? Let's see if it's on. Oh, no, that was on. Check, check. Okay. Um, and that's where I found myself. I was along the border um, in northeastern China that borders North Korea, and we were doing a story about North Korean defectors. These are people who have fled the very desperate conditions in North Korea where starvation is rampant and where rights are extremely limited. But once these defectors, many of whom are women, and many of whom are trafficked across the border, they get to China, rather than finding freedom, they find themselves caught up in a different kind of despair. The Chinese government does not regard North Korean defectors as refugees, and so if caught, they will send them back across the border to North Korea, where they could be imprisoned, tortured, or even executed. And so many of these women find themselves perfect candidates to be exploited. And many of them are forced into marriages. Others are lured into the prostitution industry. We, we interviewed a woman who had been sold off to a Chinese man. And she told us that her husband was the poorest person in his village. He was old and crippled. But even so, she felt better off living in this loveless marriage to this poor peasant because she could get white rice in China as opposed to having to scavenge for food in North Korea. We also met with another young woman. She'd just recently escaped from North Korea. And she said that back home, she was only able to eat meat about three times a year on very special occasions. And she heard about opportunities in China. She heard that she could get a job working in the computer industry. And so after being trafficked into China, she did find herself working with computers, but it wasn't as she expected. She was forced to chat with men online and undress for them via webcam. And I will never forget, she held her arms behind her back with tears streaming down her eyes, showing us how her boss had tied her up so that she could not leave the room where she was working. On the morning of March 17th, our team had gone to the frozen Tumen River, and this is the river that separates North Korea and China. And we were there to document the thoroughfare that so many North Korean defectors are taking to escape into China. While on the river, it was never our intention to cross into North Korea, but we were with a local fixer um, who has worked with other media in the past, and, and he continued to walk across the ice, and he motioned for us to follow. We did, and um, we were on the ice for just about a minute before we knew we had to leave, and we crossed back over to the other side, and it was about halfway across on that ice when I heard yelling. And I turned around and saw two North Korean soldiers with their rifles raised in the air, yelling and chasing after us. And I ran for my life. And I ended up on the other side, on the Chinese side, um, and the soldiers, soldiers were able to apprehend my colleague Yuna Lee and me. And they violently dragged us back across the ice into North Korea. Um, I have replayed those moments on the ice over in my head over and over again. And a lot of people have speculated that we were set up by, by our guide. But I don't like to speculate, and I don't like to place blame on anyone but myself. It was my decision to follow him. Um, the ironic thing is that this is a story in which I wasn't necessarily fearful for my own physical well-being. I was more concerned about the defectors we are interviewing, and we were very careful when we were interviewing them to conceal their identities. But as journalists, 
anything can happen once you're in the field. Situations can evolve and you are forced to react at that moment. And in that moment, I was forced to rely on my instincts and my instincts failed me. And what ensued was the most terrifying time of my life. At one moment, I'm reporting on a humanitarian crisis that's taking place along the border with China and North Korea that neither country wants the world to know about. And in the very next moment, I am a prisoner in the most isolated, secretive nation in the world, one that views the United States as its arch enemy. I literally felt as if I had landed on an alien planet not knowing if I would ever see my family again or survive until the next day. Um, Yuna and I were placed in a jail, in separate cells in a jail along the border and for a few days until we were eventually transferred to the capital, Pyongyang. We were separated when we got to Pyongyang and spent the rest of our captivity apart. During my captivity, I was interrogated, and my interrogator wanted to know all about the story that we were working on, past stories that I had worked on. He wanted to know whether I had any connection with the CIA. Um, having Vice President Gore as the chairman of our company certainly raised to eyebrows, and I had to convince them that there was no connection um, with, with the CIA. And then one day, my interrogator came into the room and with a big blue folder that had all of this information in it, a dossier, and he asked me a question that I had actually been fearing the whole time that I had been in captivity, and he asked me, has your sister ever been to North Korea? And the answer to that question was yes, but you'll have to excuse me because I'm having a bit of a surreal moment as I'm actually sitting here in Little Rock with President Clinton sitting in front of us. Um, listening to my sister recount this story because it, it, it was just over a year ago um, when Laura was still in North Korea and we didn't know that if we, it, we didn't know if we would ever see her again. And a couple of months ago, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I just kissed her yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, I kissed her yesterday. This is a child that I never thought I, I I might never have, and um, I hope you don't mind I brought a picture. <laughs> She's right over there. Her name is Lee, spelled L-I, Jefferson Clayton, uh, named after someone you might know. <laughs> and um, I have to say, she looks a little bit like a boy with that receding hairline. We probably should have named her William Jefferson. <laughs> um, but, and, and now, as Lisa said, you know, from, from being held in North Cap uh, captive in North Korea to being here with you all, we, we both feel so incredibly blessed. So when I got the call at 2.30 in the morning on March 17th from my brother-in-law, who said, Laura has been abducted by North Korean border guards, my heart instantly sank for obvious reasons. First of all, there was never any intention to go into North Korea. The story that we they were covering took place in China in South Korea. So when I actually heard that they were actually inside North Korea, I became instantly terrified. But the other reason was because I had actually spent time in North Korea myself. I had worked on a very critical documentary about the North Korean regime in 2007. Um, as a journalist, North Korea was sort of like the holy grail for me. I have had the fortunate opportunity to travel all over the world several times over. I have reported from Afghanistan, Iraq, Algeria, so many, so many parts of the world, but the one place that always eluded me and the one place that I wanted to visit the most was North Korea because so little was known about it. So few Americans had ever been inside. And so uh, a, a very well-known cataract surgeon friend of mine from Nepal called me out of the blue one day and said, I've been invited to conduct medical missions inside North Korea to go and set up medical camps in three different cities, and I would like to know if you'd like to go with me. So I agreed to go, and the caveat was that I would have to say that I was part of the medical mission. I, could, I, I, I would go in using my passport, but I would have to say that I was part of this medical team, which was kind of ironic, because even though I'm Asian, I know nothing about science and medicine and the whole thing, but, <laughs> but that's nevertheless how I got in. 
So we arrive in Pyongyang and instantly our cell phones and all communication equipment are removed from our possession and we're able to visit three different cities in North Korea. Um, we are instantly assigned six to eight government escorts to uh, live with us inside the, the guest houses where we were staying to monitor our every move. In fact, when I would go jogging around the building, I was only allowed to jog laps around the building. I would always have eyes on me every single day that I was jogging. So uh, there, they made an overture out on the news that this renowned cataract surgeon was going to be in North Korea. And if you, if, if you had eye problems or vision problems, you were to report to these locations. And it was astounding. In every city, hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. And they had so many different kinds of ailments. Some people had heart conditions. Some people had horrific dental issues, not just eye problems. But when they heard that a foreign doctor was going to be in North Korea, so many people rushed to, to get checked up on. So. Um, I was supposed to be, I, I didn't conduct any operations, fortunately for them, but I, Dr. Ruit, Dr. Sandeek Ruit is a teaching doctor, so I actually operated the video camera much of the time, and we said that in order, we wanted to follow some of the patients and follow them home to see how they navigated in their homes, and, and we wanted to follow them after they got their surgery so that they could, could see how they, they, they um, were able to maintain themselves. And it was really interesting because going in with this cataract surgery was, surgeon was an interesting entree into that world. We thought that we would only be able to see what happened in the, the operating room. But it was, it was unique because a lot of the people who showed up with cataract problems, some of them were very, very young. And cataracts are, in the United States, we don't even blink. If someone has a cataract, the operation is very inexpensive. Um, and, and, and very few people really suffer with cataract problems. But in North Korea, there are people as young as seven who had severe cataract problems because cataracts happen as a result of malnourishment or severe conditions. Some people were, had been suffering from total blindness for more than a decade there because they, had no, they didn't have the resources to fix their, their problems. So we were able to actually witness that very, very unique window into that world. And I actually brought a couple of clips from that documentary. The first one is a, a little bit of background. President Clinton touched on the, the US-North Korean relationship a bit, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective, a little video perspective into the, the US-North Korean relationship. So in the first part of this clip, by the way, um, when you go into North Korea, which is, is, as you know, the most isolated place in the world, there's no, there are no advertisements whatsoever throughout the entire country, which we can't even imagine, I know. The only photographs that exist throughout the country are those of the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, and his father, the great leader. In fact, we were able to shoot inside a home, uh, which was a very rare look in, inside uh, a North Korean family's home, and they didn't even have any photographs of their family members. They only had pictures of the great leader and the dear leader swimming or riding horses and, 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 and glorious photographs. Um, and so when you, when you take pictures of the dear leader or the great leader, you must photograph the photos. You, you can't cut any part of them off or you will be reprimanded severely. So the beginning of this shot, um, one of our team was lying, was laying on the ground to take a photograph of this enormous, enormous statue of the great leader, and you'll, you'll see what happens, and then it will go into a little bit of the, the, the history. Back on the streets of Pyongyang, our cameraman wants to take a photograph of a statue of the great leader. It's huge, so he lies on the ground to make it fit in his shot. But the minder lets us know this is a mistake. A big one.
exist between North Koreans and outsiders more than 50 years after the fighting ended. In 1910, Korea was colonized by Japan. The brutal occupation ended more than 1,000 years of Korea's reign as a sovereign nation and was a major source of shame. Japan lost Korea in World War II and the country was split between the American-backed South and the Russian-backed Communist North led by a young rebel named Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung invaded the South to unify the country. And the U.S. opposed communist expansion at all costs. As many as 4 million people died in the Korean War, which included some of the most brutal warfare the world has known. In a four-month period alone, the U.S. dropped nearly 1 million gallons of napalm. 18 of 22 major cities in North Korea were at least half obliterated. In 1953, after three years of fighting, Korea remained divided in almost exactly the same place as it had been before the war began, the 38th parallel. While most people think the war ended more than 50 years ago, there never was a peace treaty. And more than 19,000 days later, the very, very long ceasefire continues today. a little perspective on, on North Korea. And it, it certainly was a, a surreal experience being inside. And it's, it's so hard for us to imagine what it might be like to live under this kind of system. I mean, the level of indoctrination is unlike anything that I think we can even imagine. Uh, there are only tel two television stations in North Korea, and they consist entirely of gov government propaganda. As I said, there are no advertisements whatsoever um, throughout the country. Uh, there's no communication. People aren't allowed cell phones. There's no internet. So when people, when, when grown-ups and adults and children come home from work and school, they actually talk. Can you imagine? <laughs> um, but it really was uh, incredibly eye-opening. And President Clinton referenced the beautiful rice harvest throughout the country. And, and I was surprised to learn from one of our, my escorts that after our team was to leave, he was going to go with his fellow countrymen to work in the, in the rice fields because every citizen of North Korea, whether you, are, you work in the government or you're a law enforcement official or a teacher, you are obligated to work in the rice fields during rice harvest season. That le level of patriotism is, is incredible because it's such extreme indoctrination. In fact, in, the, in all three of the guest houses where I stayed, every single book on the bookshelf were written by the dear leader and the great leader. So as I mentioned, I was with this cataract surgeon in three different hospitals, and they probably performed well over 1,000 operations during the 13-day trip. And so you might think that after being treated from blindness for over 10 years, the people would, would express their gratitude to the doctor and his team for having delivered this kind of medical care. But, um, but you'd be wrong. And I brought a clip to show what happened when hundreds of people would be corralled into a room with, the, with their bandages, and, as soon, and, and all the bandages would be removed simultaneously. And you'll see what happened um, when the bandages were removed.
So at the completion of this medical trip, um, we, we put some tapes away and, and hid them in our bags and, and got them out of the country. And it's kind of interesting because as soon as I arrived, I had to fly from Pyongyang to Beijing. As soon as our plane touched down in Beijing, I was like, freedom! <laughs> in, in China, of all places. <laughs> But I, I never thought that I would have any dealings with the, the government of North Korea again until. <laughs> and then um, Yuna and I became the first Americans to be tried in North Korea's Supreme Court and sentenced to 12 years of hard labor. And what many people may not realize is that that sentence was broken up into two parts, two years and 10 years, and that the majority of the sentence, 10 years, was given not for the act of crossing the border, but for our work as journalists. The, the North Korean government is perhaps the most paranoid regime in the world, and so anything that deviates from this very perfect image that it has built for itself is seen as a threat. So the fact that we had been interviewing defectors who had painted a critical image of their government was viewed as hostile. And my nearly five months in captivity are filled with horrifying moments uh, from being beaten on the Tumen River and physically dragged into North Korea to the hours and hours, day after day of interrogation, to actually being accused of trying to bring down the North Korean government. But I want to take a moment and share with you some of the glimmers of humanity and compassion that I also experienced in captivity. Um, one day, one of my guards, she had gone home to visit her family for a few days. And when she came back, I asked her if she had a nice visit with her family. And she looked down, sort of forlorn, and in a very quiet voice, and she said, yes, I did. But I didn't want you to know that I was seeing them because you've been separated from your family for so long. I felt bad that I could see mine when you haven't been able to see your parents or your husband or your sister. Another guard told me that at school, whenever they had a mean professor, they would call him Bush. <laughs> She's not just saying that because we're here. <laughs> Really. Um, and, and another guard, after learning that I had just been sentenced to 12 years of hard labor, seemed genuinely shocked and saddened for me. I remember I was curled up in a ball in the corner of the room crying uncontrollably. And she came up to me and she said something that I will never forget. Laura, she said, have hope. And these were women who were tasked with keeping me prisoner. They viewed me as the enemy. They were cold and they were mean and they were intimidating when I first met them. And I looked at them as perfect models of Kim Jong-il's mass propaganda machine. They were always quick to spew anti-American rhetoric. And they spoke about Kim Jong-il as if he was this god-like figure. But I mentioned these moments of humanity because I think that they're a testament to what happens when people from, quote, enemy nations get a chance to interact and communicate. Perceptions can widen. Now, there's so much more to tell, and I know we have very limited time, um, but one of the questions that people often ask me is, why, why President Clinton? Why was he the person that was so necessary to travel to Pyongyang to secure re your release? And of course, the answer is long and complicated, and President Clinton went into some of that right now. But the simple answer, I think, is that Kim Jong-il had always wanted to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> and President Clinton conveyed something to me on the plane that I, I remembered, and it stayed with me. And it has to do with something that happened more than 15 years ago. And that was when Kim Jong-il's father, Kim Il-sung, passed away. President Clinton was the first person to call Kim Jong-il, and even before Kim's own allies. And Kim expressed this to President Clinton. He said he had always remembered that gesture of respect and had wanted to meet him ever since. 
And I just think that it is so remarkable that one of the main reasons for our release from North Korea can really be traced back to this simple phone call. I do think that it just makes us all realize how even the simplest act of kindness and reaching out can have the biggest impact, in this case, one that saved our lives. And so um, in closing, I just you know, have to thank President Clinton once again. Uh, my family and I are eternally grateful. And I just have to thank you for being my rescuer in chief. <laughs> <laughs> We're now going to move to the second half of our program, and I'd like to invite Ann Jansen to come to the stage. And thank you for being here, President Clinton. I know you're expected at another event, so thank you. Okay, were you nervous with President Clinton sitting right there? I was so nervous. <laughs> Can I say that now that he left the room? <laughs> Share with 100 of our, 100 of our friends. <laughs> you have it? Can you guys hear me? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Test, 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 test. There we go. You know what? I'm going to move. This has been bugging me. I've been attacked by the plant the whole time, so I'm going to do that for you. <laughs> Um, I got a call from Stephanie Street uh, last week. We've both been on vacation, so I can't even remember when it was, but uh, she asked me to do this and, and mention that the book uh, was a good read, I think is how you said this. I have to tell you guys, for those of you who have not read this book, um, it is the most riveting book, and I don't know if it's because I'm a... a journalist, and I use that term very loosely in the presence of these women who have traveled the world, bring, shedding light on, on human trafficking and other, other ills of the earth. But um, it really is just a fascinating book. And, and one of the things that I found so fascinating about it is the parallel stories. I told them the way that they have laid this out, where we, we start from your perspective. Well, you give some background, then we start from your perspective, and it, and it ping-pongs all the way through the book so that you really do get a very good sense of what happened from each perspective as it's unfolding, and it is just a brilliant way to do that. So I asked them about the process of writing this book and how hard it was to do this. As journalists, I was commenting on how much you remembered the details uh, and how your journalistic training came into play there. But talk a little bit about the process and how you decided what to put in, what to leave out, and, and if you wrote it together, in tandem, or separately. Okay. Well, deciding to write this book was um, a process in itself because as a journalist, I'm, Lisa and I both are so used to reporting on people and issues, and then to come home and have these cameras pointed at me was very awkward. Um, but I did, I did know that a lot of people wanted to know about what happened, and I also wanted to share what we went to cover. So writing it was very therapeutic and cathartic. Um, Lisa and I, and to be able to write it with Lisa was so incredibly special. After being separated from my family for so long, the fact that we could have this time together was really, really wonderful. We wrote separately. Um, I wrote my section and Lisa wrote hers, and but we were physically together most of the time. In fact, we would be on a couch in my living room. Um, I had a laptop on my lap, Lisa had a laptop on hers, and we'd have a single blanket covering our feet. Um, and, um, and so we each wrote separately, and, and yes, and as you mentioned, it was, everything was really fresh. I, I wrote it pretty soon after the release from captivity, so I had a pretty good recollection of everything. And then we interwove the stories together, and we were actually surprised by how, how seamless it all came together. And you know, I've, been, I've been working in this business for over 20 years, and even though I had heard Laura's account of what happened in captivity, 
when I actually read it, when, when I wrote her, read her writing, I was so moved and, and proud. I'm the, the big sister, and I'm the one who has always protected my little sister, but I, I was just so proud and, uh, of how she handled herself. I mean, she handled herself in such a, a mature and um, dignified way, and I, I just have so much admiration for, for, for your courage through that, babe. Both of you had to be so calculating in every move. I mean, you from a political standpoint, when, when the president was talking about this political nightmare that suddenly you were caught in the web of, and, and you on a much more one-on-one -on -one level with your captors and your interrogators and, and the court judges, uh, your defense attorney, which is a great story. Um, but but. Talk a little bit about how you could not take a step or make a phone call or do an interview or answer a question day after day after day, hour after hour for five months, having to be so careful with every word. Well, as Laura said, this is the most paranoid government on earth. And in, in the first couple of months, we had been advised by the State Department and Vice President Gore's office to try and lay low for a bit. Because, and, and, and we were actually happy to do so, because having had an experience in North Korea myself, I knew that this was such a hypersensitive government. And anything that we said could be misconstrued or uh, construed as being accusatory. And we just were so afraid of doing that. And so even though I was considered an enemy of the state um, for, for the documentary that I produced with National Geographic, somehow Laura convinced her captors to allow her to call me. And calls from American detainees in North Korea has never been allowed, but, but somehow Laura convinced them, if you, if you let me call my sister, perhaps we can figure out uh, what, what, what we should do. And so, I got the first phone call from Laura about two months into her captivity. And of course, when I heard her voice, it was the most amazing, it was the most amazing little voice that I'd ever heard. I mean, it was very, very soft. And um, I was uh, obviously concerned about how she was. And she had this very sort of calm voice. And she said, Lisa, we, we have to, this has to be strategic. We have to figure this out, so be calm. My, my little sister from North Korea was telling me to be calm. <laughs> And so I, in the calmest voice I could employ, said, well, we've been very quiet. Um, we, we're just wanting to, to, to figure out what your, 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 those holding you would like. And we've been, when, we've been quiet. And Laura said, I think it's been too quiet. And it was that, at that moment I realized that we had to go public. And again, having had that experience in North Korea, I knew that when we did so, it had to be strategic and it had to be incredibly apologetic and even obsequious because any misstep or anything that the North Koreans could misconstrue could, could, could be terribly risky for Laura and Yuna. The telephone calls that we were allowed, I think Lisa mentioned they were unprecedented. unprecedented. Um, and you imagine having never not spoken with your family again and here's your opportunity to speak with them and you don't know if you'll ever get another chance to speak with them. Um, I was so happy to hear Lisa's voice, but I couldn't approach the call from an emotional level. I had to use every single second that I had to talk about what I thought was necessary to, to be done. Otherwise, I didn't know if I'd ever get another chance to talk to her. So I tried to be very, very strategic. And our, our two countries, the United States and North Korea, don't have a diplomatic relationship. So even though I've, I've worked in this business for a long time, I, I think even I had the assumption that when there's a, a, a problem, you can just pick up the phone and call diplomats in another country. But when two countries don't have a diplomatic relationship, you just can't do that. And so after Laura convinced her captors to let, me call, uh, let her call me, we in effect became this channel of communication through which our two governments were communicating. And because Laura and I are sisters and best friends, and even before her captivity, we'd, we'd probably talk on the phone five or six times a day, I can tell in her voice when she's telling me something 
in her voice or in someone else's voice, which, which obviously became the case. And it became clear after uh, subsequent phone calls that President Clinton had to be the envoy. I mean, it went through a couple of different, uh, there were, there, there were, it, it, it became very, very complicated. But in the end, when she said it has to be President Clinton in a voice that um, was very stern and, and one that um, I, I wasn't quite familiar with, because I, I could tell that, that that request was not coming from her personally. And my goodness, can you imagine I'm requesting that the 42nd <laughs> president of the United States travel halfway around the world to this mysterious country to rescue us. To tell you the truth, I was at that moment preparing myself mentally to go to a labor camp um, because I did not think it was possible. Who yeah. happens to be married to the current Secretary of State of the yeah. United States, our, our chief diplomat. And oh, yeah, there's that, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, so I said complexity, you, I really meant it. It is, and, and you, you both do such an excellent job of explaining the complexities of all the different parts of this that, that come into play, and that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the book is you're in the throes of this, you're going through this, but have the presence of mind and the self-control to do what you need to do uh, to get out. And, and one of the most fascinating parts for me is when they said Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton. And because the president's married to Secretary Clinton, there was concern about having the go-ahead for him to make the trip. So you initially took the Carter route, but then once that was set up, the North Koreans said, oh, no, 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 no. It has to be Clinton. And again, we're talking about former presidents here. <laughs> Let me just cancel that <laughs> request. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't like the North Koreans were just throwing out these names. Dealing, trying to figure out what they wanted was like deciphering a code or a puzzle. In fact, at one moment I said to my interrogator, please, just tell me what what is necessary, and I will try my best to convey it and, and, and make it happen. And he said, we can't tell you that. That would be a violation of your human rights. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, they went, it was just a very roundabout way of getting this information. And um, so at one point, I, I had been asking, and I knew that that uh, Vice President Gore would be willing to go, and I said, you know, please, um, I know that he'd be willing to come here. And even and President Carter, we should say, um, agreed to go yes, as well. Right, but they said, well, why don't we just cut off the vice and go for president? <laughs> and, you know, that's how they would, kind of, you know, that's how our communication went until it eventually became clear that President Clinton was the best and only option, and that is exactly how the interrogator put it. He is your best and only option. Which then you let your sister know, but I was wondering if you would have named your daughter Lee Earl if... <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, you rescued her from that as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we were talking about the, the impact of technology on the story, um, you, you mentioned about the cell phones being taken away. Nobody has the right to, to communicate, make phone calls. Internet is completely out of the question. And I was thinking about how, on one hand, the technology that we have today allowed you to receive handwritten, scanned notes from your husband, which I can't imagine what that was like, seeing his handwriting. It, it allowed you to send emails in the middle of the night to the ambassador in Sweden, it's true. who then was able to, I mean, there, the channels there that opened up, it allowed you to communicate with the airplane, Steve Bing's plane, when it was mm -hmm. on its way until it crossed over into North Korean airspace, I guess. They didn't want to risk anything there. But then conversely, it also allowed the North Koreans to do a Google search and find out that your sister had that National Geographic. How, how, how much longer do you think can governments along with, with this type of, of t strong, stranglehold, stranglehold on their people yeah. control when technology is advanced to the point where that's going to become more and more? Do they even understand that this 
It's, it's it, astounding that they've been able to maintain the stranglehold as long as they have. I mean, they're this tiny little country that is just out there in defiance yeah. of the rest of the world. And I'm sure many of you know that, that North Korea shares the same peninsula as perhaps the most technically advanced country in the world, South Korea, but yet somehow um, one of the most economically booming China. Yeah, but that's why that DMZ between North and South Korea is the most heavily fortified border in the world. It, it is amazing that they've been able to keep their people closed off for so long. Um, and it is interesting that certain things do seem to be seeping in along that border with China, which is relatively porous. Um, in casual conversations with my guards, I would ask them, oh, do you know who Madonna is? Mm -hmm. And they did not know. Um, but they, uh, one of them hummed the song to Titanic, like Celine Dion's song Titanic. And it seems like anywhere you go in the world, everybody knows <laughs> that song. Um, so it is, it's interesting how much longer they can really shut off the rest of the world. I, I thought it was interesting too how you explained your relationship with your captors, especially Min Jin. You, you gave them aliases right. to protect them, but uh, <laughs> she actually never knew any of their names. Really, no. I just referred to them as Miss. And and the one that you mentioned about visiting her family, and when she came back, she didn't want to tell you. That's my favorite name. She named her Paris because <laughs> <laughs> she was a little. You could tell she was from more of an elite family. Right. You did develop the relationships. You could tell the compassion with Mr. Yi, uh, different people that, that, have you had a chance to hear anything or yeah. any kind of follow-up from any of them? I haven't. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I will. I was, when you gave some items to them, when it was evident that you were going to be leaving, do you think that they were able to use those or take those? You know, it's interesting because we, I was allowed to receive packages from home after, after a couple of months, they allowed packages. They allowed letters and packages. Letters were my oxygen. I read those letters over and over and over again, memorized them word for word. Um, and in the packages, I was allowed to receive packages, but not everything in them. And so the authority was, would go through each package and they would separate things and I would be allowed to have some basic clothes or some some basic toiletries, and um, and shoot, I forgot where I'm going with well, this. Well, um, I'll I'll just add something. When we when we found out we could send packages, I wanted to send some clothes to Laura, so I would rifle through her her wardrobe and I'd pull out very boyish looking drab t-shirts and cargo pants and so on, and those were the kinds of clothes pieces of clothing that I'd send to Laura. And what would happen when you would Get the packages. And they would and they would come and look because they do know that America is a wealthy country, um, and they would go and look and be very excited, thinking that they would see these beautiful dresses, <laughs> and they would be so disappointed to see you know these sweats. And I think that it probably reinforced the North Korean propaganda of America as a very drab place. <laughs> do you think? Do you think that? This, the original story that you went to cover, maybe because of their reaction and what happened to you, has even become more widespread known. I mean, like unintentionally, what they intended to do in keeping the story under wraps now, because of your story and your wonderful reporting in this book, that the world knows. The world is taken inside their system and being held captive through your eyes and ears and your experiences. Um, I, I hope so. I do think, I mean, that's in large part why we also wanted to write this book, to raise that awareness. And um, I do hear from a lot of people who say, oh, we didn't know that was going on. It will be interesting to see what happens in North Korea. I mean, I don't know if, if we will see a free North Korea within our lifetime. And President Clinton mentioned the, the, the successor to Kim Jong-il. He's in his 20s. It's, he's one of Kim Jong-il's sons. And he's someone who has studied abroad so no one knows whether he will be able, he will maintain that strictness or whether he will allow the country to open up. And it, and, and it could present a, a fairly colossal quagmire if he does decide to open it up. And, and that's one of the other reasons why 
China is so, um, doesn't want this story out because China is really terrified that if, if the doors open, and South Korea also, if the doors open, then we'll just, it, both countries will be flooded with, with refugees. Has it changed your willingness to take a risk for the story, having this in your rearview mirror now and, and now that you're a mother? have? Um, I do think, I, I am still extremely passionate about this issue and others that I've reported on in the past, but yes, being in captivity, coming home, having a child, it has changed my perspective. I'm really right now focusing very strongly on spending time with my family, and I do c want to continue reporting. I will probably stay a little closer to home to start <laughs> out. <laughs> What about Big Sister over here? You're just launching on a new endeavor and you... Yeah, I... Risk assessment is always very important to us and it always has been. And I wasn't the one who had to spend so many months in captivity and, and I'm, I'm glad my sister is slowing it down a little bit because she was maintaining such a, a frenetic pace before she even left on this trip. But I actually, I feel so more compelled than ever in a way to try and expose things that are happening in the world. I mean, even though we have so many quote unquote news networks on TV that are on 24 hours a day, if you really stop and think about it, how often are we offered the opportunity to actually watch real reporting, right? I mean, these days, the highest rated shows on our news networks consists of, of guys yelling at each other and telling you what to think. And that's what we're calling news. So I actually think that the need for reporting is, is, is more severe and important than ever. And as long as I can continue doing it. Did you ever buy your sister her parka? And you went to a place? <laughs> she, she, tell the story about these, these women are from California and grew up <laughs> in a warm climate, and you're, you're crossing a frozen river between North Korea and China. Right. I, before I left for this trip, I, I knew it was going to be extremely cold, but as Lisa mentioned, I had been going at such a crazy pace that I was just packing the night before, and I didn't have, I couldn't find my big coat because I own one of them in Los Angeles, and <laughs> I didn't have any use for it, so it went missing. And I called Lisa and asked her if I could borrow a coat of hers, and she brought it to me the very next morning just before my flight. Um, I ended up, that was the coat that kept me warm during my first nights, actually for many nights, um, in captivity, because the electricity in North Korea, it, it's such a, um, such a Sporadic. poor country yes. that the, the electricity would go off frequently, and we were still in the very bitter cold months of uh, month of March um, that I could literally see my see my breath in the room. And so I held on to that coat, which even though it was tattered and bloodied, it was a reminder of my sister. And no, thanks for reminding me. I owe you a coat. <laughs> I was just gonna say it's my coat. <laughs> my favorite coat too. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> what? <are the> <laughs> Wait, 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 there's another funny story I was going to ask you. She, your mother, did your mother ever hear from the, the New York? Oh. Uh, did, she, so, she was going crazy and calling every day. So. Yeah, my mother, my mother <laughs> did get a little crazy during Laura's captivity. And, and she actually, <laughs> yeah, she secured the telephone number. So, so the United States and North Korea communicate through the, the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang, which is considered our protecting power, and also through the permanent mission to the United States, North Korea's permanent mission to the United States, which is, uh, to, sorry, to the United Nations, which is in New York. And there's a, a man named Minister Kim there who uh, is sort of the go-between. Um, I mean, he, the, the State Department communicates quite a bit through him as well. And somehow my mother found his phone number. and. <laughs> called him relentlessly every single day and left messages and sent a fax and an email every single day to the point where one day he just picked up the phone and talked to her to console her. <laughs> and he actually, he, she made it a point to say that he was actually very kind and said, look, I, I wish there was something that I could do, but this is, this is far out of my hands. And he was right. I mean, this was a decision that was, was um, 
held in Pyongyang only. And then you, you, after being with your mom for 10 days, left to get a tattoo. Oh. <laughs> peace and it, it love. It says peace and love. In yeah, Arabic? It, Why in Arabic? I, I just, I, I thought it was, it was neat. nice. Yeah. <laughs> and nice. you talk in the book about possibly getting a tattoo. Have you gotten a tattoo yet? Well, it was, Lisa wrote a letter to me, and she said in the letter that I have, she said, I've been going so crazy that I had to get out and let out a bit of, of steam, and, and so I got this tattoo. And so that night, I tried to envision Lisa's tattoo, and I also tried to envision what tattoo I might get, and it actually kept me occupied for about 10 minutes thinking I would get, like, I hate North Korea, <laughs> or, you know, this, this really sucks. And, and, and it, 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 at least, at least it, 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 it occupied my time and my mind for about 10 minutes as I was trying to sleep, which was very hard to do. Well, you both have been so wonderful tonight. We really appreciate your coming and sharing your stories. And thank you for coming here with the president as well. I know that that was a special moment for you. But thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.